this for some time, and of course on Wednesday nights, uh, I get bogged down, Brother David, and we get stuck in a little place, but we'll be there a while, it'll be okay, we'll move on later. But in Revelation chapter 13, we find that a man has shown up on the scene, and this man has been publicly talked about for a long time, and that guy is who? The Antichrist. The Antichrist is one of the most uh, preached about and talked about and the most worried about person in the Bible. And of course, we're going to teach tonight a little bit more on the Antichrist and talk about the Antichrist a little bit, but we always want to preempt it with, we won't be here when the Antichrist gets here. If you're here when the Antichrist gets here, then you've already missed the boat, you might say. You don't want to be here when the Antichrist shows up. What, what you want to happen is you want to give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ, be saved by his marvelous grace, and then be raptured out when Jesus Christ comes to take the church away. That's what you want to happen in your life. Now, the Antichrist is some person that's going to show up, Brother Alvin, and he is going to take the world scene, and when he does, the whole world is going to like him, want him, and to be a part of his life. And there are people right now that are looking for the Antichrist to come, and they don't even know that's what they're looking for. Now, I want you to notice here in verse 1, it says, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having t uh, seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And of course, blasphemy is anything that is against God. Anything that is said or done against God, that's what blasphemy is. And that's what the Antichrist will be. He'll be everything that's not God. He'll be everything that's against God. He'll be everything that God said don't do, he'll be for. He's going to be anti-God. He will be full of blasphemy. The Bible says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. You see, the world will be in love with the Antichrist. And of course, we talked about last week how that the sea that we see him rise out of, that is a type of people, how that this man will rise up out of nations and he will become the Antichrist. And there in verse 5 says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, that's three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Now I want you to notice what it says in verse 7. Notice what it says. And it was given unto him to make war. Now I'm going to show you here a video just quickly, just a brief video. It's a, it's a news feed uh, from Fox News is what it is. And it demonstrates that much of the world is looking for the Antichrist to appear. The Jews, and I, I want to just preempt this, the Jews, everybody know what I mean when I say the Jews, the people of God, the Hebrews that are in Israel right now. Have you ever seen those pictures of uh, those Jews and they're standing on the wailing wall and they have the black hats on and they have the big curls, everybody know what I'm talking about? And they've got paper in their hand and they wail on the wall. About, they, they, they cry and they rock back and forth and they pray and they're asking for the Messiah to show up. They are looking for the Messiah. Now, I hate to say this, but the Messiah has already been here. You see, they're looking for a man. And when I looked on when I looked online and kind of did, and I was looking up some of the some of the, some of the um, the Jewish uh, bylaws and what they believe and what their purpose is. You see, their Messiah is not like our Messiah. Our Messiah was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came in great wonder and power, who gave His life for many. We see that they're not looking for that. They're looking for a man who will bring peace to the world, who will conquer the world and then put them in control. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for a man to appear. You know, there's another a group of people called the Muslims, and the Muslims are looking for somebody to come, and they're looking for a man. And so I'm going to have him play this video, and what this video demonstrates is that when the Antichrist arrives, many religions will say, hey, that's the guy we've been waiting on right there. Brother, you go ahead and play that. Thank you. Well, growing concerns the crisis over Iran's nuclear program is taking on dangerous religious overtones. Scholars are now warning that Iran's leadership is fascinated with this return of a Messiah figure uh, who's linked to the apocalypse somehow. According to experts, the coming of the Messiah is triggered only by war and destruction. 
Religion correspondent Lauren Green has more on this very important angle of this story from our New York Bureau. Lauren. Hey, thank you very much. Well, you know, in Islamic, the Islamic Republic of Iran, politics and religion are one. And religious experts warn that the Iranian president's obsessive belief in the apocalyptic figure of the 12th Imam may be fueling Iran's quest for nuclear weapons. The 12th Imam, known as the Mahdi, is believed to be the anointed one, a superior spiritual being who disappeared in the 9th century as a child and was hidden by God. When he returns, they believe, he will usher in peace under Islam, but only after intense periods of warfare, conflict, and chaos. A certain number of Shia Muslims believe they can hasten the Mahdi's return by creating those conditions. Within the 12er Shiite world, there is an extremist organization in Iran uh, called the Hojatiya group. And there are several of these groups uh, in the Iranian system. Uh, they believe that when the 12th Imam comes as the Mahdi, uh, this new era begins, and they believe they can accelerate his arrival by creating global chaos. That's the dangerous component. President Ahmadinejad is on record as stating he believes his mission is to pave the way for the Mahdi's return. His recent speech at the United Nations had prophetic overtones of his destiny. Central to the 12th Imam beliefs is the Jankara Mosque just outside of the holy city of Qum. A well behind the mosque is where believers say the Mahdi is now hidden. Ahmadinejad's cabinet has pumped millions of dollars into the mosque. The, the belief is that they come up to this mosque and they drop uh, their prayer request and they believe that uh, Imam Mahdi uh, will answer their prayer. And so the, the thing that makes this particular mosque different is that there is this well, this green-like metal box at the back of the, uh, of the, of the mosque. Uh, and, 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 and this is where they believe that one day, in the no, uh, not-too-distant future, Imam Mahdi will come out of this well and will, uh, will take a dominion over the entire world. Now, many Iranians don't believe in the coming of the 12th Imam, but the prophecy is very popular among the elite Revolutionary Guard, and this is the group that would be in charge of a potential nuclear arsenal. And that, says Ambassador Gold, is why the U.S. should pay more attention to this particular religious ideology. I guess Guys. we all should, uh, Lauren. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting part of the story. Thanks. When you think about it, you think about this. Their, their thinking is that there was this guy, this little five-year-old boy. His name was Magdean, and he was uh, five years old in the ninth century, 900 BC or 900 AD. That he was five years old, and he was taken away, and he was taken to heaven. That's what they. That's what they believe, and they believe that one day he will return as a grown man to that mosque that we were just talking about, and that mosque that the Iranians are pumping millions and millions of dollars into that mosque because they believe that that's the place that some man will show up, and when he arrives, he will arrive with an intellect, he will arrive with charisma, he will arrive with power, and that he will take over and dominate the world and bring the world to the place that it ought to be. And when you consider that, when the Antichrist shows up, all he has to do is arrive in that place and that automatically will pull every Muslim in the world to follow him and they will believe that he is the 12th Amon. We find that if he comes out of there with great power and great intellect and the ability to, to soothe and to talk to people, that the Jewish nation will look over and say, you know what, he might be the Messiah. He's got all the answers. He's fixing everything. That might be the guy. And so when you think about this, the Antichrist is always kind of painted on television as this person that has 666 all over him and, and he looks like the devil and he acts like the devil. And you're always thinking, who in the world would follow that guy? That's not how he's going to arrive. He's going to arrive very, very popular. And when he comes in and he brings all the answers and he brings all the things that the whole world's looking for, the whole world will run after him and say, Alvin, this has got to be that guy. We have been waiting for this guy all this time. We've had nothing but war in the Middle East. We've had nothing but problems in the world. We've had nothing but economic collapse. And all of a sudden, this guy has every answer. This has got to be the guy that we're looking for and the world will fall into deception of the Antichrist. I want you to take your Bible, and I want you to look at second, or let's go to Matthew chapter 24. I want you to see this quickly. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus spoke about this 
when he was here on the earth because he knew that this day was coming and he knew that it would occur and he was warning that it would happen. And see, the Antichrist is going to come and in the end time, he's going to deceive many, many people and he's going to come in a popular fashion. In verse number 15 of Matthew chapter 24, I want you to see it says, And when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place, who also, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now I want you to notice what it says there. He says that when you see the abomination that Daniel talked about, stand in the holy place. Now where's the holy place for the Jews? The holy place for the Jews is right there in Israel. It's going to be right there in Jerusalem. It's going to be right there where the temple is supposed to be built. And even right now, if you study and you go over, I, I love to read about it because I think it's really awesome. But there's a whole group of rabbis. Their only job right now is to reassemble the temple. That's what they're doing right now, trying to get the temple put back together. They've already made the table of showbread. They've already made the altar of incense. They already have the golden candlesticks made. They're working on the veil right now. They're working on all these things. They've got all the, the high priest's uh, clothing already made, and they're planning and working on trying to get the temple rebuilt. And Jesus said, when you see that person stand in that place, you better run away because something bad's fixing to happen. You see, the Antichrist will show up, and when he comes, he'll appeal to not only those that are in the Muslim religion, but he'll appeal to those in the world that we live in today. And when he stands in that place and he shows great wonders and does great things, many people will be deceived by the Antichrist. Many people will fall to his charm. But notice what he says, and I want you to get this quickly, that as we go through here, he starts off as a good person that everybody wants to be around. But notice what it says in verse 18, neither let him that is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For, when, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should, be, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days should be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto thee, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. I want you to see this, that he says that when the Antichrist shows up, there'll be many Antichrists. There'll be many of those that are out there that will be claiming to be Jesus. They'll be claiming to preach the truth. He said, but you don't believe those people because they're not telling the truth. They're lying to you. And what's going to happen is the Antichrist will show up. And the reason the book of Revelation says that he will blaspheme, Brother Alvin, is because he will stand up and say, Everybody that's been before me is wrong. I am God. You should worship me. And you think, well, man, who in the world would worship him? It's been done before. You know, that if you go into the book of Daniel, you find when they set up the golden image. Everybody remember that golden image that Nebuchadnezzar set up? Everybody remember that? 60 cubits high. Everybody remember that? It was six cubits wide. And it had six instruments that played. Everybody notice how many sixes that was? There was three of them, wasn't it? Sure was. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that he declared that the whole world should bow down and worship that image. And you know what we find happened? The whole world bowed down and worshiped that idol except three people. And that was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I want to say this to you, that when the Antichrist shows up and he says, I am God, worship me, it will not be the first time it happened. And the world will follow after him. They will clamor after him. You say, preacher, there's no way anybody would worship a man. Who in the world would do that? Well, in Rome's time, everybody worshiped the Caesar. In Pharaoh's time, everybody worshiped the Pharaoh. You see, mankind has worshiped men over and over again, but this time the Bible says he will come in with lying wonders, and he will show things that people just can't help but believe. This must be God. You know what's happened before in the Bible. Remember when Moses went down into to Egypt, and he walked in, and he turned the water into blood? Everybody remember that? 
You know what I would have said? Oh, we give up. We believe you, man. Hey, anybody that can walk in, turn the river to blood, that's got to be a guy sent from God. Hey, we're, we're with you, Moses. But you know what the Bible says happened? Pharaoh called his magicians in. He said, you guys come in here. He just turned water into blood. Can you do that? They said, absolutely we can. And they turned water into blood. You say, how in the world did they do that? The same way that the Antichrist with, with the power of the devil, with the power of Satan. That's how they do that. When Moses took his stick and threw it on the ground, what did it turn into? A snake. I could have done that part. The part I couldn't have done is when God said, take it back up. That's the problem I'd have had. Uh, that snake would still be going somewhere. I still couldn't get him. Can you imagine that? Throw a stick down and turn into a snake. Robert, I'd be gone. You hear me? The Bible says Moses fled out from before it. I'd have been gone. They'd still be looking for me. But the Bible says that Pharaoh looked at that and thought, wow. And the Bible says his magicians took their sticks, threw them on the ground, and they became serpents. Somebody says to me, yeah, but they must have just been mad, just like a trick. No, you don't just plan to do a trick like that. The Bible says that God's snake ate their snake, but it's still impressive that they could make a snake out of their stick. You say, preacher, how in the world did he do that? By the power of the devil. That's how they did it. You say, preacher, you mean that the, power, the devil has power? Absolutely the devil has power. Why do you think half the world runs after the things of the world and the things of the devil? Because he has a power in this world that he lives. He has a power to control. He has a power to seduce. He's got a power to make you want to do things. Look at Eve. She was sinless. And, 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 and Satan said, look at that tree. Isn't that nice? Wouldn't you like some? And before long, she had failed to his serpent. I want to say this to you, that when the Antichrist comes, he'll be just like that magician in Egypt, but 20 times better. He'll be the most convincing person that's ever been. He'll be that one that cries, hey, I am God, worship me, look at me, follow me. I'm the answer to what you have in your life. You say, preacher, would people really do that? I think about Jim Jones. Was that in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, the People's Church, preacher in Chicago? Thousands of people followed him. Thousands of people thought, boy, this guy's a man of God. He's a preacher. He had this idea, hey, guys, we're going to, everybody here, we're going to move to Guyana. No, I'm not going. I don't want to go to Guyana. But you know what the church said? Absolutely. We're talking about thousands of people selling everything they have, giving it to him, and moving to Guyana with him. How many people were in for that? These people were. It's just a guy now. They get down there. They start doing things they shouldn't do. Things are illegal. They shoot a senator that comes down to visit. That's bad news. He says, I tell you what we're going to do. We're all going to drink this Kool-Aid. It's got cyanide and we're all going to die. I'm good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Not me. Thousands of people drank Kool-Aid and died. You know what I'm trying to say? People will follow people. I'm just telling you they will. People will fall, follow a leader. They will run out after him. They'll say, man, this has got to be the guy. Look how sharp he dresses. Look how good he talks. Look how friendly he is. Look at what kind of signs he can do. This has got to be the guy. And everybody else, you look at him and think, what are they thinking? Everybody remember when the comet Hellbop came by? Everybody remember that? There's a group of people in California that had this plan. This preacher said, I'll tell you what we're going to do, guys. This comet's going to come over in a day or two. We're going to go buy brand new Nike tennis shoes. And I'm not lying. I'm not making this up. Go look it up. They all go get brand new Nike tennis shoes. They all put on these robes. And when the comet came by, they killed themselves. This guy convinced these people that, hey, when it goes by, we'll kill ourselves. We'll jump on the tail of this comet and float off into... Whatever drugs they're doing, Sammy, they were bad drugs, man. I'm telling you, you don't have enough money to convince me of some plan like that. But somebody believed what that guy was selling. What I'm trying to say is that mankind is a, is a sucker anyway, and that when somebody shows up with power and prestige and ability and, celebrity, and, and as a celebrity, the whole world will clamor after him. The Antichrist will drag people to him. He'll be the biggest star that there's ever been. People will stand in line to see him, hear him, and touch him in the beginning. You see, just like anything Satan does, he's a liar all the time. And he'll give the world all these promises of things he's going to do, but in the end, he'll break those promises. You see, he's out for him. He's not out for them. 
Now, I want you to take your Bible and look at 2 Thessalonians with me. And we'll just give you a couple things quickly about this Antichrist. And I think it's important for you to know this, Brother Danny, so that when you are talking to somebody and they start coming up to you going, hey, man, man, be careful, boy. Don't be taking them any kind of marks. Don't, you know, don't be doing that kind of stuff. You can say, hey, I'm not that worried about it. I'm okay. I- I'm all right. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I remember when I was a kid, and I've said this in here tonight, and I've said this in here on Wednesday nights, that the barcodes came out. You know, you know what I'm talking about? The little beeps, beeps. When I, when I was a kid, believe it or not, and, I, and my, t- my son can't believe this, you know, he's 18, he, he can't believe it. I remember a day when there was price tags on stuff. You know, clerk had to stand and go, 295, 395, you know, that, he don't, he don't, I, I tell him, no, man, that's how it used to be. Somebody had one of them little guns, you know, every box of cereal, you know. And then they come out with the little beep, beep, which is kind of cool, beep. But I don't really like this self-checkout. See, I like that where you have to go and stand and, you, you know, you, you beep, but you don't put it in the bag fast enough and then it kind of it grabs you and like, oh, you can't go to the, I'm like, this thing's worthless. Why don't you always put somebody here to ring it up for me? Anyway, that, that's not really in the message. But I remember when that happened, everybody started talking about, hey, hey, boy, Man, that's the mark of the beast, boy. Don't buy a loaf of bread. It's got one of them little beep things on it because I'm telling you, it's bad news. Of course, if you tried to buy something now and didn't have a little beep thing on it, you couldn't get it. You know, wasn't, there's nothing made that don't have it on. But, boy, I remember that, you know. And I seen a fellow the other day. He had a tattoo on the back of his neck. He looked like a little barcode. You know what I'm talking about, little barcode things? I always wondered if I had one of them little guns, would go beep or not. I don't know. <laughs> 99 cent. What in the world? There's a deal on this fella. Y'all need that because y'all are kind of tired tonight. Y'all look tired. <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and Paul's writing because here in Thessalonians, they're just, or Thessalonica, they're just like me and you. There's a church there in Thessalonica. They're hearing rumors, man. People were saying stuff like this. Hey, man, you know that new president? I think he's the Antichrist. Y'all need to go get all your beer cans and put them in a hole and save them up. We're going to make bullets out of those. And you need to get all the tires you can. We're going to fortify this because, man, when the Antichrist comes, we've got to be ready. And that's what they're saying. You know, and I hear people tell me that all the time today. Preacher, I'm telling you, every time somebody gets elected, guess who they are? Antichrist. I don't care if it's a Democrat. I don't care if it's a Republican. When they get elected, I hear somebody say, oh, Man, I think that's the Antichrist. You're like, dude, whatever. Verse 1, see what Paul says. Paul says, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our what? You can say it a little louder than that. What is it? Gathering Gathering together unto him. You know what the next thing you should be looking for in your life? The gathering of us to Jesus Christ. That's what you ought to be looking for. You ought to be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Alvin, I am not walking around going, oh, is that the Antichrist? Oh, oh, wait a minute, that might be him. Oh, that's a mark. I don't want to take that. Oh, I can't. You know what I'm looking for? I wonder if today Jesus is going to come back. Now, I believe Jesus could come back right now, don't you? I don't believe there's not one thing holding him back. I mean, we could walk out of this building tonight, bam, Jesus come back. We'd be gone. Pew. I mean, we could be riding on the road home, and man, Jesus could come back. I mean, there's not one thing that would stop Jesus Christ from coming back right now. He could come right now. If you're not saved, you ought to get saved because you don't want to miss out on the rapture. You don't want to have to go through the tribulation. You don't want to have to uh, face the Antichrist. Get saved today. Be ready to ride out with us when it's time, okay? What does he say? He says, I beseech you by the gathering together of ourselves. Not what it says in verse 2 here. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us that the day of Christ is at hand. He says, you know what he's saying? Relax. What are you worried about? He said, David, you don't need to be worried. You don't need to be shaken. You don't need to be scared. Relax. That's what he's telling you. How can you relax if the Antichrist is coming? You, You can't. How can you relax if if, if tribulation as has never been known by the world is coming? How could you relax? You you couldn't. You you just couldn't. He says, I beseech you by the coming of Christ. Then he says, don't be soon shaken. Verse 3 says, let no man do what? You know what that tells me? That there are people who will lie to you. He says, do not let anyone deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first 
and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So he, is, he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He says, remember ye not when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. How many people believe that? That the mystery of iniquity already works today? I'm telling you right now, when you look in the world and you say, why is the world the way it is today? It's because the mystery of iniquity is at work right now. It's planning. It's getting ready. Sin, the devil, the world, they're getting ready for the Antichrist. They're getting ready. They're working right now. But what's waiting? What, what are they waiting on? Why haven't they already done it? Why isn't the Antichrist here yet? How many people believe that Satan wouldn't already try to take over the world if God would let him? He would. He, he can't do anything without God letting him. He can't do anything. Notice what it says. He says, now we know, verse 6, and now we know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. What, what's withholding him? What do we know that's withholding him? Notice what it says in verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So who is that he that has to be taken out of the way before the Antichrist can come? I'll tell you who it is. It's the Holy Spirit of God. You see, here what we have, what we have is God's in heaven, Jesus is in heaven, and the Holy Spirit's inside the believers. You see, we are carrying around with us part of God. And as long as God is on this earth, the devil can't be in control of this earth. And the Bible says that the Spirit of God is what constraineth the believers. It's what holds us accountable. It's what makes us live for God. It's what tells us, hey, that's wrong. It's what tells us don't do that. Jesus said when the Comforter comes, Chuck, he will condemn the world of sin and judgment. That's what it says. And that's what the Holy Spirit does right now inside us, even though nobody else realizes it. The Holy Spirit is condemning this world and it is saying you need to live right. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You need to try to do better. You need to be come to Jesus for salvation. The Holy Spirit in me and you is controlling what's going on here on the earth. You say, what do you mean? Because as long as the Holy Spirit dwells on this earth, the judgment of God can never come to this place. But when the Holy Spirit's removed, then Satan can have his way. So what's an example of that? An example of that is Lot. Everybody remember Lot? If you don't know who Lot is, Abraham had a nephew. He's a good guy, great guy. Single guy. When Abraham went out to look for a, a city, Lot said, hey, can I go with you? He said, yeah, come on. The Bible called Lot righteous. He was a righteous man, a righteous soul. He went out and God blessed Lot so much that God, Lot had so much stuff that his stuff and Abraham's stuff got in the way of each other. Abraham's camels, Lot's camels, the people who were watching them got in fights. Lot said, you know what, we need to do something. Abraham said, you're right, why don't we split why don't you go one way and we'll go the other, and that'll give peace. Abraham said, which side do you want? Lot said, I don't care. Abraham said, really? You pick, I'll go the opposite direction. Lot, the Bible says, looked at a place called Sodom. Everybody remember that? He said, that's the place I want. He said, you go that way, I'll go the other way. That's what he did. The Bible said he pitched his tent toward Sodom. He could see Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible says that Lot began to visit Sodom and Gomorrah. He'd go down and visit, and he'd come back home. Go down and get groceries, come back home. Wasn't too long, though. Lot kind of liked it down in Sodom. The Bible says that Lot moved to Sodom. He lived in Sodom. Matter of fact, Lot married a woman from Sodom. Lot had children that grew up in Sodom. Everybody understand me? Sodom and Gomorrah were the two worst places on the earth. God hates wickedness. How many people know that? I mean, with everything in him, the Bible says that the wages of sin is what? That you cannot get away with anything, can you? Boy, Lot's down here living in these ungodly cities. They're a terrible place. And the Bible says that the, the crimes that were going on in that city and the innocent blood that was being shed in that city, it cried out to God and said, Would you not avenge us, God? That's what it was saying to God. And God said, I've done had all I can have. We see that a lot in the Bible, don't we? Does everybody remember a place called Nineveh? Remember, remember that with, with Jonah? God said, Jonah, go to Nineveh. You cry out to them, but I'm going to destroy this place in 40 days. Everybody remember? 
Of course, Jonah took the long way. You know, he went through the belly of the whale and come out, finally preached. Everybody in Nineveh said, oh, he's right. We got to get right. They got right. God spared them, right? But you know, in this case, nobody got right in Sodom. Everybody continued to live the way they wanted. These angels God sent to destroy that town stopped in to see Abraham on the way to destroy it. Said, Abraham, we're going down here to Sodom. We're going to destroy the city. And Abraham said, oh, Lord. Would you destroy a city for, 100, for 50 righteous people live there? God said, I would not. Now listen, I will not destroy a city if there's 50 righteous. Well, you know what Abraham knew. There wasn't 50 righteous people in Sodom. So he started whittling God down. What about if there were 20? Would you destroy it if there were 20? He said, no, I wouldn't destroy it if there was 20. Nope, you can find 20 righteous people there. I won't do it. Why? Because God will not judge the righteous with the unrighteous. Everybody hear me? He will not. Got him all the way down to 10. What about 10? I mean, if I find 10, God said, you find 10, I won't destroy it. What if I can find five? You can find five. I won't destroy it. Why? Because God will not destroy the righteous with the unrighteous. The Bible says these two angels go down to Sodom. They're going to check it out. Find these five. Find these 10. Well, you know, they don't find none. They find one. They go to Lot, and they said, Lot, um, we've come down here to destroy Sodom. you got to go. Lot said, no, no, I, I don't want to go. This is my home. This is my family. He said, listen, you got to go. He said, I'm fixing to rain fire and brimstone down this place. you got to get out of here. Okay? He says, well, I'm going to go tell my family. He went and told his kids, and guess what they did? They laughed at him. Parents, if you live like the world in front of your children and then try to tell your children not to live like the world, guess what they do to you? They laugh at you. Don't live like the world and tell your children not to. They will laugh at you. He lost his children because of the example that he set before his children. Everybody understand that? Anyway, that's a heavy subject. Whew, I had a preacher preach that, boy. Mm. It'll break your heart, boy. You think about what you, the impact you make on your children's lives. Mm. Anyway, <laughs> get on that. I won't get off. He, he tried to reach him. They wouldn't hear him. Angels went to him and said, listen, pal, you got to get out of here. And he said, but I got to get my wife. You know, his wife was from where? That is her home. You know, she's from there. That's what she likes. That's what she wanted. That's where she was at. He said, but you got to go because we got to destroy this place. You know, Sodom kept on, I mean, Lot kept on, kept on putting it off. What's the Bible say happened? The angels took Lot. Now watch this. This part I like. They picked him up. You know what's going to happen one day here on this earth? Whether a Christian's ready or not, you know what God's going to do with you? He's going to pick you up one day. And he took them and he set them way over here where it was safe. And he said, you run for the mountains because everybody else is going to die. And here's what I'm trying to tell you. That the judgment of God will not come on the believers of God. Because God will never judge the righteous with the unrighteous. It's not going to happen. And when you see here that the Holy Spirit indwells us, it's just like Lot being that righteous soul in Sodom. Sodom was safe as long as Lot was standing on the ground. But when God took Lot out of there, their, their, seal, their fate was sealed at that time. And when the Holy Spirit of God is removed from this place that we live on right now, and we're taken to heaven, the world's fate is sealed. The Holy Spirit will be gone. The preachers will be gone. Those that love God will be gone. Those that serve God will be gone. The righteous will be gone. And here will be a place like Sodom and Gomorrah where anything goes and there's nothing to control it. And the question will be, who will make it through it? It won't be a lot, but there'll be some. The Antichrist will at that time have all kinds of power. He'll have the power to rule and to reign and to convince people of who he is and what he is. And he'll be just like those magicians down there in Egypt. He'll say, that's not a big deal. Watch this. And when he does those things, the world will follow after him. See what happens here is that when Satan shows up and the Holy Spirit's gone to convict, man, everybody else will just fall right to him. They'll fall right to him. Now, I wanted to preach down through these few verses of Thessalonians, but I, I didn't get there. But the Holy Spirit, when it's removed, man, there'll be nothing left to hold him. And watch what it says. Verse number eight. And then shall that wicked be revealed. That wicked 
be revealed. I'm going to show you next week. We'll talk about it next week. But you know who that wicked one is? He's the son of perdition, the Bible says. You know who else is the son of perdition that we think we don't think about? And that was Judas Iscariot. Jesus said, I've, God, you've given me 12, and I've kept all of them except the son of perdition. And he's went back to his place. And I want to say this to you, that Satan always finds a man to use to deceive and to betray the people of the earth. If you say by the grace of God, praise the Lord, you just won't be here. Ain't that great news? That's awesome. We'll be like Noah. We'll be in the boat floating on top of the storm. That's what we'll be. We won't have to worry about it. Praise the Lord. All right, let's take up prayer requests. And if you've got one of these blue cards, sometimes I forget to tell you. And if you're new, you'll forget. Fill your prayer request out and lay it here on.